But, but tonight, I, 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 I told Pastor Jim I wanted to entitle this, the workshop time, uh, I Am Helps Ministry. And, 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 and so help ministry, you know, helps is not a job, but, but it's a calling. And, and so most, most people in the body of Christ, you will be in the ministry of helps, and it's an honor to be in helps. Um, you know, everything that you do for God is, is remembered and documented. You know, this morning I talked about the gentleman that actually died and went to heaven, uh, Jeff Davis. I wish I had some of his, his uh, books, but one of the things that, that Jeff uh, uh, emphasized, he said, man, everything that we do here on earth, the angels write it down. Uh, he said every piece of paper that we pick up, they document it. Every light bulb that we change is documented. Um, you know, the Bible talks about rewards in heaven. You know, the Bible says God is not unrighteous to forget our, our labor and works of love that we do in his name. Everything that we do for God, it is documented. And remembered. In fact, one of the things he told me that, that, that one of the angels had a book, and he said it, he, he opened it to the right side, and it, it went out 100 yards this way. And he opened it to the left side, and it went 100 yards the other way. And, and he said, they write down everything that we do. And a lot of times we don't think, man, picking up a piece of paper, or we don't think that there's value, value to it. Running the sound system, we don't think there's value to it. But everything that you do, it, it, I like to call it current, currency in heaven. The Bible talks about laying up for yourself treasures in heaven. You know, just like the basketball players, they do layups. You know, the Bible says lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. You may think nobody's watching, but God's watching. You know, everything that we do. But uh, uh, tonight, I Am Helps Ministry. In fact, I told Pastor Jim, I, I, I said, Jim, I'm writing a new book, and that, that's going to be the title of it. Uh, I want people to take ownership of Helps Ministry. When you think of golf, who do you think about? Tiger Woods. When you think of basketball, I think about Michael Jordan. When you think of tennis, Serena Williams, Andover Christian Church, who do you think about? You know, we want to put your name there when people think of Andover. Andrew, Christina. You know, I, I want your name to be synonymous with it. I want you to be so, so involved mm -hmm. uh, with the church. And man, the worst thing that can happen, God's going to bless you. <laughs> you know, I was thinking, I said, man, you know, I, you know, serving God will keep you in good health. It'll, you know, keep your bills paid. You would just live a, a, a rich, full life just by following God. You know, seeking ye first the kingdom. You know, a lot of times we let the cares of life come in and we get caught up. And man, how are we going to pay this bill? And how are we going to make this game? And how are we going to go here and go there? How are we going to pay for our kids' college? You, you know, but if you put God first, you, you know, if, if you put the kingdom first, everything will work out. You know, if, if you put God first, everything will just flow. You know, like I said this morning, I don't understand, you know, how a brown cow can eat green grass and produce white milk. But it happens. When you deal with the supernatural, you know, the Bible says all things are possible uh, with God. So, But today I want to talk about this first segment, this first maybe 30, 40 minutes, how to increase your value. 
I like to tell, tell people around the country, you don't need a new church. Your church needs a new you. You know, it's time to get involved. It's, it, it's time to start doing things and, and growing and, and um, you know, doing what, what God has called you to do. You know, your, your gift and your purpose are tied together. I heard a story one time about a lady, man, she lost everything she had. Well, she lost a house, her kids were not serving God, and she made the decision. She said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to kill myself. So she drove to this bridge, and she was getting ready to jump off. And as she was leaping off this, she, she saw this older gentleman drive up in the car, and she jumped off anyway. And she hit the water, she was waiting to die, and she saw that the gentleman had jumped in behind her. And she saw that he couldn't swim. And so she had a decision to make, she said. She, she said, man, if I die, he's going to die. And so she made the decision to swim over and save his life. And, and that, that decision to save his life gave her a reason to live. And that's what purpose does, you know, purpose. It gives you a reason to live again. And so that's why it's, it's so important. You, you're, you're not here by accident. God, God has you here for a purpose. And so I want to talk about how to increase your value. Number one, you must be willing to do things other people are not willing to do. If you have your Bibles, go to Luke 25. You must be willing to do things and go places other people are not willing to do. You must be willing to go places other people are not willing to go. Luke chapter 10, We're going to, the story of the Good Samaritan. Verse 30, and Jesus answered and said, a certain Man went down from Jericho, Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him, departing, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came by a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed on the other side. And likewise, the Levite, when he saw him at that place, came, looked on him, passed on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was and saw him and had compassion. And went to him and bound his, his, bound his wounds, poured in the oil and wine, and set him on his beasts, and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave him, gave to the host, and took care of him. And whatsoever thou spend it more, when I come again, I will repay thee. And and so the story of the good Samaritan, you know, you, you had two other characters in that story. You know, you had the priest and you had the Levite. You know, but the Samaritan, he, he had compassion on the injured man. I like to put it like this. The, the injured man, he was beat up. He, he was passed up. But thank God he was lifted up. And, and that's what we should be doing. We must be lifting people up. We have to be willing to do things. Other people are not willing uh, to do. And so a lot of times, man, people don't want to get involved. You know, the priests had the opportunity. Remember this one we talked about opportunities. They passed up an opportunity uh, to be a blessing. And a lot of times, you know, man, man the pastor uh, back home, the pastor would call a work day. And a, a lot of times guys that should have been there you know, they, they didn't show up for the work day. And so, but you, you must be willing to, to, to do things other people are just not willing to do. And so I, I was talking to a Pastor Craig, and uh, uh, Craig was telling me at, at Rama, you know, Craig, Craig Hagen, he was telling me, he said, Byron, you know, that's why uh, we love you. Because anything we ask you to do, you do. 
We don't, even, we don't even have to ask you. If you see something that needs to be done, oh, you just do it. And a, a good pastor needs people like that. A couple of years ago, I, I was meditating, and I was trying to find good examples of people that, that, that help and serve. And the Lord directed me to the Holy Ghost. He's called the paraclete. And I started looking at the Holy, the, the Holy Spirit. The Greek word means paraclete. It means to come along one side to help and to serve. And that's what pastors need. Pastors need good people that will come along and help them. You know, pastors, pastors need help. And taking your, uh, your gift and plugging it into the local church. You know, when uh, Jesus, um, Jesus was uh, crucified on the cross, and many Bible scholars and many theologians said that Jesus fell three times when he was going up um, to be crucified with the cross. Many theologians believe that the cross weighed about 100 to 150 pounds. And so he was carrying the cross, he was beaten, he was bloodied. And the Bible says that he, he, he fell. And there was a man there named, named Simon. And the Bible says that the Roman soldiers compelled Simon to help Jesus carry the cross. And I've been teaching the past couple of years, and I've been looking at the role of Simon, you know. Right when you need the most help, when you think you're not going to make it, God will plug in a Simon to you. You know, if you notice, you know, Simon was there for the Passover in uh, Jerusalem. And God has Simons along the path of your life. They may not look like you. They may not sound like you. But at the time when you think you, you won't make it, when you're, when you're ready to give up, a Simon will, will be right there to help you. You know, God, God, ha God has people placed in your life and in your path to help you do what you need to do. God, God has Simons placed everywhere. And one thing that we need to focus on, on is becoming a Simon. Every day I pray, Lord, show me somebody that, that I can help, that I can be a blessing to. You know, somebody that I can come alongside and help. You know, when you start helping people, you won't have to worry about, you won't wonder, man, if God's going to come through for me this time. God, if, if, if God can get his resources through you, he can get it to you. You know, I remember when I started tithing, um, you know, I used, to, I used to read the word, and I said, man, God, God's going to open the windows of heaven and, and pour me out a blessing. And I was always looking for the windows to open. <laughs> and one time I was in a situation, my car payment was due, and I, and, and I went to the Lord. I said, Lord, I'm tithing. Um, I'm, I'm giving offerings. I got two days in my... Uh, car payments due. And the Lord spoke to my heart. The Lord told me, quit looking for the windows of heaven to open and become a window. Become a window that I can get my blessings through to, to other people. You see, God, God wants to use you to be a blessing to other people. God wants to use your, your life to be a passageway so that he can uh, bless others. But there's a mindset there that, that, uh, that has to change. I had to change. I had to go from being on the receiving end to being on the giving end. 
but be, be willing to do things other people are not willing to do. Be willing to go places. You know, I couldn't understand why people go, go to the mission field. Man, why, why would somebody give up a job, give up financial security, leave their family, and go to the mission field? And then I read the story about Peter getting out of the boat. You know, when you become so in love with, with, uh, with God and so, so infatuated with the things of God, I understand why, pe why Peter got out of the boat. When you just want to follow him, when, when Jesus is your everything, and you just want to please him, I understand now why people go to the mission field. When you find out the goodness of God and, and, and you taste and see how God is, how, how good he is, you want to impart that life to others. You know, be willing to do things other people are not willing to do. Be willing to go places other people are not willing to go. You know, one of the things that, um, you know, Pastor Jim was talking about the NRC. And one of the things that I did when I took over, when I became the director, we had about a, a, a $50,000 a year budget. And the Lord spoke to my heart. I started, uh, I gave a scholarship uh, in Pastor Hagen's name and and then and then Mrs. Hagen's name is called the Presidential Scholarship and the Vice President Scholarship. And so when I did that, I wanted to honor them. Uh, when I did that, man, our finances just went through the roof. And I got a call one day from our accounting department. They said, Byron, where all this money is coming from? And I, and I said, I don't know. You, you know, one, one of the areas that I, uh, that I supervise, we have one of the biggest Christmas light displays in the country. And in my department, we handle the uh, concessions end of it. And man, people come out, people come from five states over. We, we, we probably get a half a million people that, that are come through the Christmas lights. And so we do the hot chocolate, the cappuccino, the uh, funnel cakes, and everything else. So, so, so it's a big operation. So uh, the first year we did 40,000. The second year we did 100,000. Uh, the third year we went up to 150. Uh, the fourth year we did 200,000. And we've just been growing because we decided to honor uh, our pastors, our leaders. When, when you start honoring your leaders and your pastors, man, God will always honor you. And I just sit back and, 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 and marvel. In, in, in 10 years, we went from 50,000 to now we're doing over 600,000 in 10 years. And it just keep in it is is like a snowball, and so we just had people drive down the street. They just stop in the building and said, "Hey, man, we don't know what this is, but we just want to give you guys money. We just want to uh, uh, be a blessing to you guys." But increase, God. God will always take take care of you. Number two. You got to be willing to get out of your comfort zone. Your, your comfort zone is your greatest enemy to progress. You know, you got to be willing to do things. You got to be willing to go places that other people are not willing to go. You know, a lot of times it's just easy just to settle for just, you know, having everything nice and comfortable and calm. You know, but God is a God of increase. And God expects us to keep growing, to keep evolving, to keep developing. You know, I read uh, an experiment one time that a, a group of scientists got together. 
They, they did a scientific experiment with fleas. They, they put a couple hundred fleas in, 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 into a box, a glass box. And when they put the fleas in, they, they, they put the lid on it, and you can hear the fleas hitting the glass top. You know, the fleas, they were trying to get out. But after a day of being in that environment, they, they quit trying to get out. And, and so the scientists, they took the lid off, and, you know, nothing happened. The fleas quit moving. They were not jumping, try, trying to get out, because they, they became conditioned to their environment. And that's what happens to, to a lot of Christians. They get used to being, you know, average. You know, it's just so easy just not to grow. It's just so easy to take your gift and, and dig a hole in the ground and, and be comfortable. I, I uh, read this in the business book. It's called Good is the Enemy of Great. And it goes like this. Good is the enemy of great, and that is the one key reason why we have so little that becomes great. We don't have great schools principally because we have good schools. We don't have great government principally because we have good government. Few people obtain great lives in large part because it's just so easy to settle for a good life. The vast majority of companies never become great precisely because the vast majority of companies become good. We don't have great Christians because it's easy to settle for just being a good average Christian. We don't have great churches because it's easy to settle for just having a good church. Good is the enemy of great. And, and so don't settle for just being average, but man, live a life full, live life to the fullest. You know, do, do, do everything within your power to get everything out of this life that God has for you. Because it's just easy, man, just to settle and, and say, hey, I'm just going to, I'm just going to relax. I'm just going to come to church and just not get involved. But you, you can do exploits. You can do amazing things just from plugging your gift into the, the local church here. You know, Abraham, God, God spoke to Abraham and told Abraham to, to leave his hometown. And the Lord told him, hey, I will make your name great, and I will bless you. And sometimes, you know, when God gives us direction, man, we start wondering, man, how is this going to work out? You know, but you just got to trust him. You just have to trust him. You, you know, another, another component, preparation. You know, preparation time is never wasted time. How many of you guys like, like basketball? You guys are watching the NBA Finals and the Celtics are in the Finals. Um, I was reading about Steph Curry, you know, I, I, I read he shoots a thousand free throws a day. You, you know, he goes to one area of the court and, and shoots a thousand free throws a day. You, you know, he, he goes to the east side and shoots a, a hundred free throws. Then he moves over and shoots another hundred. You know, a, a thousand a day, you know, every day shooting a, a, a thousand free, free throws. He, he stays in rhythm. When game time comes, his percentage shots on free throws are high. I think he's at about 60%. He hit 60 to 65% of his free throws because he, he, he stays in rhythm. As a Christian, it's so important to stay in rhythm, stay faithful. You know, running the sound system week after week, staying in rhythm, staying in, straightening out the chair, staying in rhythm. It's so important to stay in rhythm. That way when a conference comes, I'm in rhythm. I'm here week after week, month after month, cleaning the restrooms. If you clean the restrooms, stay in rhythm. If you stay, stay, if you stay in rhythm when it's game time, 
you know, the confidence will be there. You know, you have a, the confidence. You might see him shoot the ball and walk away. But it's so important to stay in rhythm, stay faithful. Keep your gift plugged in, doing what, what, well, what God has called you to do. So we talked about um, increasing as a person. Number one was doing things that other people are not willing to do. And we talked about um, increasing. I want to talk to you guys now about doing things in excellence. You know, it's so important to do things in excellence. You know, someone once said, perfection is of the flesh, but excellence is of the spirit. See, you can do things in excellence and still make mistakes. You know, the Bible says that an excellent spirit was found in Daniel. Excellence. You know, excellence doesn't show up when the lights come on or when the crowd shows up. Excellence has to be your, your brand. You know, it's so, so important to do everything in, in excellence. Colossians chapter 3. Do everything in excellence. Do everything, you know, pleasing to, uh, to the Lord. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. It says, And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you might receive the reward of the inheritance. For you serve the Lord God. You know, do, do, do everything right the first time. You know, when I was a kid, um, my mom used to give all of us a week to do dishes. And one night she, she came and talked to me in my room. She, she uh, said, Byron, you know, I got to talk to you about something. She said, you know, when it's your turn to do the dishes, I can tell. You know, when it's your brother Rodney's turn to do the dishes, I can tell. When it's your week to do the dishes, I find dirty dishes in the oven. The floors are dirty. You don't wipe the counters off. She, she said, I can tell every time when it's your turn to do the dishes because you don't do everything in excellence. And, and she told me something that I never forgot. She, she uh, said, you leave your name on everything that you do. And, and she said, right now, your name is filthy. <laughs> she said, when, when it's Rodney's turn, Rodney is my oldest brother, he, he, she, she said, the counters are wiped off, the floors are swept. I don't find dirty dishes anywhere. She said, remember, son, you leave your name on everything that you do. And so I never, never forgot that. And, and so, you know, when the pastor, when Pastor Jim or Shelly gives you a responsibility, are you doing it to the best of your ability? You won't be, be perfect. You know, I told you guys a story this morning about the baptismal pool that I, you know, cost, cost the church a lot of money, a lot of time. And, you know, I had a good pastor. He never told, told people I was the one that did it. And, and I told you guys that he turned a, a crisis that we had in, into a men's fellowship. And you will make, make mistakes in, in, in ministry, but, but you have to forgive yourself and bounce back. You will make a lot of mistakes. The more responsibility that, that you have, 
Uh, mistakes are going to be made, but you have to move on uh, from it. I like the Oakland Raiders. Their, their, their motto is committed to excellence. You have to be committed to excellence. You know, you also have to be careful, man, who, who do you align yourself with? Who do you associate yourself with? I heard Willie George make this comment years ago. He, he said, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. And I read this some, somewhere, friends are like the buttons of an elevator. They can take you up or they can take you down. You know, so, so you have to be careful. You know, I started hanging out with the wrong crowd, man, when I was a teenager, and, and I wound up backsliding. And knowing I was doing wrong. You know, but thank God, God, God's a God of a second chance. You know, I gave my life to the Lord. I, I was eight, and when I was 17, I gave my life back, back to the Lord. And been going strong ever since. But... Excellence. Perfection is of the flesh, but excellence is, is of the spirit. You know, always do things right. I always tell, tell, tell my staff, hey, make sure, I know you guys are going to make mistakes, but just do the best you can. You know, be, be led by the spirit. And it's, it's, it's so important to be led by the Spirit of God. When I was a missionary over in Peru, I was, I was over in Peru at the time when Peru had a lot of terrorism. In fact, when I went down, my parents, they were, they were very concerned. They said, Byron, you know, you, if you watch the news, they got bombings, people are dying every day. And I, you know, I just thought, you know, they were just being concerned parents. And so when I got there, oh my goodness. It was bombs going off every day, and, and um, yeah, and the, the uh, senior missionary told me, he said, Byron, you, know, you, you really have to pray. Everywhere you go, every bus you take, every taxi you take, you really have to pray uh, to get direction. If you feel led not to go to work, uh, you may not want to come into work. And so one day I, I stepped out of the house to go to, I was going to the office and the Lord told me, go back home. And, and thank God I obeyed right, right where I was going to walk, a bomb exploded. And I said, Lord, thank, thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the Holy Ghost. When I was a Raymond student, Keith Moore shared the story. How many of you guys listen to Keith Moore and know Brother Keith? Um, when we were students, Keith Moore was on the Rhema staff, and he taught us giving and receiving and submission and authority. And he was telling us this story. He, uh, he, he used to be over the Prayer and Healing Center, and he said this lady called in, and she was very, very upset. He uh, said she, this, this uh, lady, uh, she got mugged. And she was upset. She couldn't figure out why God didn't protect her. And she, she was from uh, Detroit. She, she went home to buy bacon soda uh, for a cake she was making. And she couldn't figure out why God did not protect her. And, and, and he, he had to calm her down because she was upset, upset, crying and upset. And he said, tell me exactly what what happened? She, she uh, said, uh, I was home. I realized I didn't have enough ingredients to bake this cake. I needed baking soda. And I went to one store that didn't have it. And I got back in my car. And something told me not to go to this part of town. But I went in anyway. And he said, hold up. He, he said, you, you felt led not to go. And she, she said, yeah, I just thought it was me not wanting to go. And she said, when I went out, a guy took, took my purse, and, and, and I couldn't figure out why God did not protect me. And, and he said, well, the, the Lord was warning you not to go. He said, you, you, you 
overread the voice of God and, 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 and still went into the area God, God told you not to go. And she said, well, I didn't know that. And so you have to remember, man, if, if, if God's telling you not to do something, don't do it. You know, it's so vitally important to, to be led, to know. I was preaching in uh, Superior, Nebraska, about five, five years ago, and uh, I was talking about the authority that we have in Christ. And this, this um, w- uh, one lady stopped me, I was preaching. I always get stopped in, in Nebraska, this lady, she was excited. She, she uh, said that um, uh, my daughter, she was walking from, from school, and this man grabbed her and pulled her behind the bushes. And we had taught her in the name of Jesus to use the name of Jesus. And she, she, she told the guy, in Jesus' name, don't touch me. And she kept saying, in Jesus' name, do not touch me. And and finally, after the third time, the guy left her alone. <laughs> but a lot of times we forget, man, that we have authority. You know, I tell kids, man, if you're being harassed at school, if you're being bullied at school, you need to take authority over that. You don't have to be harassed. You don't have to be bullied. You can take authority and say, hey, devil, you got to go. We, we take authority over you. Harassing spirits. You know, because the devil is going to do everything he can to, to, to uh, stop you. And it's so vitally important to stand in the authority that God has given you.